looking at the life of Elisha from 2 Kings, and really kind of looking at it in terms, much as we did with Elijah, as one who was a light in a very dark world. <clears throat> and whereas with Elijah, we saw him really resting in the power of God, uh, being able to pray and have it not rain, and then pray and have fire come down from heaven, and using that power of God to show them that he is the one true God. With Elijah, we see a man that in every situation so far, we have seen him attack it with simple, peaceful faith. When people attacked him, when people created conflict with him, he did not panic. He did not worry. He did not attack them back in the world's way and try to get vengeance. Instead, he left it up to who? Left it up to God. Let God handle it. And then last week, as we saw, in various states of need, and these were real needs. People needed food. People needed Money to pay off the debtors. <laughs> People needed money, yet as they were panicking, as they were crying out, as they were saying, no, woe is me, what was Elisha doing? Well, just fix it. <laughs> just trust God, and God will provide, right? And we need to learn the same thing. Will the world notice? Will this dark world notice when we are people of faith in God? Absolutely. And we're going to see that very much today in a situation where we had bad things happening to good people. And this is a real problem, as the way we react when bad things happen. And I've seen it over and over again as I've dealt with Christians, especially even Christians who go to church a lot, read their Bible, do good things, you know, do all the good things. Then something bad happens. And what's the first thing that runs through your mind? This isn't fair, right? Those are the words, aren't they? This isn't fair, which is, I, I hate that word. I hate when any kid says it. Anybody say, I hate that idea of fair. This isn't fair. 99 times out of 100, what do you mean when you say it's not fair? I didn't get my way, right? <laughs> so I didn't get it, so therefore it's unfair. But there are some situations where you say, wait a minute, that isn't fair. <laughs> I've been doing all the right things, and therefore why does this bad thing happen? It's like the man. He won the lottery, $100 million. And he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to find the prettiest place in California right there on the coast, and I'm going to build a house. I'm going to build a house that cannot be destroyed by hurricane, by rain, by anything. I'm going to build a house that cannot be destroyed with fire. I'm going to build a house that cannot be broken into in any way. I'm going to build a house that will stand the test of time. He went above and beyond. He just laid out his money. He built a house that could not be destroyed, broken into, or in any way harmed. And he sat back in his house and said, now I've got it. Next day, a meteor came down and just blew the house apart. And what did he say? This isn't, what, fair. <laughs> I built a house to sustain everything, but can we think of everything? And by the way, who was he putting his trust in? himself and what he could do and what i want is if you leave this place if you leave your house if you, if you leave this place i want you to understand from today's story we need to get this idea out of our head that somehow when we do good things when we follow the lord when we are reading his word and going to church and ministering to others and doing all those things that does not earn god's grace <laughs> that does not earn good things it just doesn't anymore. And it, the, the reason this is a problem is because when bad things then do happen, where does our faith go? But I did this. But I did that. Why did this happen? And does the world notice when we say things like that? Absolutely. And by the way, it's the same thing they say. And if we are ever saying the same thing they're saying, we're not a light. <laughs> we're not a light, are we? We have to trust God 100%, don't we? Even when bad things happen to good people. So let's see the situation. Let's all go to 2 Kings chapter 4. And first we'll look at what good deed was done. And this was a very good deed. We're going to start in 2 Kings chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 8. 2 Kings 4, 8. 
And it says, And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither there to eat bread. So she was a very great woman, of great stature in the community, of great wealth. Uh, she was a substantial woman in the area. And she noticed that this man of God would come by often as he traveled, going to Shunem. And so she said, hey, whenever you're by, just come by for some bread. Now, how many say that's a good deed? That's a good deed. That's very nice. That's not where she stopped, though. Verse 9. And she said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which passes by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, over on the wall. And let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick. And it shall be when he comes to us that he shall turn in thither. Let's not just give him bread. Let's give him a place to stay, a place of his own, some place he can relax. Maybe do a little reading by candlelight. Maybe get a little rest from his travels. Not have to pay to stay someplace else. Let's give him a home. Now, how many say that's nice? That's very nice. That sacrificing Great expense to them to set up a little room for him, right? Verse 11. And it fell on a day that he came there, thither, and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant. Now let's uh, keep an eye on Gehazi. This week and next week, Gehazi is going to be part of the story. And he said, call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he said unto him say now unto her now i find this interesting this is what elisha does he always speaks through gehazi you talk to her you tell her and she tell you and then you tell me why i don't know <laughs> something they did maybe it was because of their station maybe because she was a woman and he was a man or whatever the situation he was always working through his assistant gehazi and he said to say unto her, Now, behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is it to be done for thee? Wouldest thou be spoken to be king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among mine own people. He says, Ask anything you want. You want me to go ask for you some favor from anybody? You need anything. I will go talk to them, and I will get it done. And she says, No, I'm, I'm okay here. The people take care of me around here. Remember, she's a what? Great woman, right? She's well known in the area. She's taken care of. No, I have no need of anything amongst these people. Verse 14. And Elisha said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily, she has no child, and her husband is old. So Gehazi notices things. By the way, is it good for us to notice things? <laughs> with other people, what's going on in their life? And she says, No, the Shunammite woman, she has no no child. And I know she would like one, and her husband's rather old. So, verse 15, And he said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door. And he said, About this season, according to the time of life, so about nine months, <laughs> thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, Nay, my lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thy handmaid. So she's also a what? cautious woman <laughs> it's like don't lie to me now i'm not going to get my hopes up here i'm not going to get all excited here if this isn't really going to happen because is this something she wanted is this going to be a great blessing to her and to her husband yes verse 17 and the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that elisha had said unto her according to the time of life so about nine months later she had a little son isn't that great and she showed kindness and god what gave her a great gift of a son. And isn't that nice? And the story ends there, and we all go away happy. No, that's not the way the story ends. Because is it easy for her to start thinking, well, I got this gift of God, this blessing from God, because I did something good. In fact, when I do good things, I should get good things from God. Now let's back, unpack that a little bit. <laughs> How many of us exercise regularly? Go ahead and raise your hand real high. There you go. There you go. Now, when you exercise regularly, 
every day for a month, let's say. Every day for a month. And then at the end of the month, you step on the old scale. How many like Mr. Scale? I hate Mr. Scale. He's always mocking me, laughing at me. But Mr. Scale, you walk in the, and you realize after a month of working out and everything that you've lost a whopping two pounds. What is the first thing that's going to go through your head? What's that? That's not fair. I have been working, working. I've been depriving myself food. I haven't been eating this. I haven't been eating that. I've been good. I haven't been to McDonald's once for an entire month, and I've only lost two pounds. And what is our natural instinct? Give up. <laughs> Why would I keep doing this if it's not going to be of benefit to me? What's my problem with my thought process there? That the only benefit is what? Losing weight. Is there benefit to me from exercising every day, even if I never lose another pound in my life? Absolutely. And I want you to, I want you to get this image into your head because it is the same with God. When we are going to church, when we're reading his word, when we're praying regularly, when we're ministering to others, it's easy for us to get in our head, well, I should get a big blessing from that. I should get something great from that. And then we step on the scales of life and we realize what? I didn't get what I wanted. But is there a blessing to doing all those things regardless of whether we get what we want? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what we have to get into our head because sometimes tragedy will strike. Not because we've done anything, not because somebody else has even done anything. Sometimes tragedy strikes because we live in a fallen world. And that's what happened here. Let's go to verse 18. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father to the reapers. And he said unto his father, My head, my head. And he said to the lad, Carry him to his mother. So he goes out there and his head starts pounding, starts hurting. Now, did something hit him in the head? Aneurysm? My, I don't know what the problem is, but he immediately said, Hey, carry him in to see his mother. Verse 20. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. Sometimes tragedy strikes. Now, if you're this Shunammite woman, what's your first thought? What was the point of all of this? What in the world, right? I did this great thing. I wanted to bless God. I, got, I made this place for this guy. And then he comes to me and says, God will bless me with a child. Now that he's grown up a little bit, all of a sudden he's dead? Where's the blessing? Where's the grace? Where's everything? Now, again, that is a natural human response. And if we have that response, who else out there will agree with that? Everybody. And again, if we're agreeing with the world, there's probably a what? Problem with our thinking. <laughs> Had she been blessed with a child? Had she had a child? Had she been able to see that child grow up? Yes. She, had she had many days of blessing with that child? But is there still hope? With God, is there always hope? And she does get a little angry, get a little confused, but also says, I need to go see Elisha. Because Elisha can do something about this. You say, what can you do about it? The child's dead. Well, again, with God, what's impossible? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing impossible. So, look at her reaction, verse 21. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. So put him on Elisha's bed. Verse 22. And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, and I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And he said, It shall be well. I like his response. Why are you going to the man of God? It's not Sunday. <laughs> why are you going to church? Why are you talking to the pastor? Why, why, why are you giving this to God? Why are you praying? It's not Sunday morning, right? Between 11 and noon, right? That, that, that's God time. <laughs> no. She has the right idea, though, right? Let me go to the man of God and pray. And what does she say? It shall be well. Does she have faith that God can do something? Has she given up? No. She has tremendous faith. But she also, in the bottom of her heart, is thinking what? Why has this happened to me? Her faith is shaken, 
but she still has faith in God. Verse 24. Then she saddled an ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. And she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass, when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to Gehazi, his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite woman. I always get a strange picture there, because I, I picture her as not just a great, and, but also a good-sized woman, maybe. <laughs> kind of going down the road, and the servant just going as fast as he can, and her just kind of bouncing along, and just going as fast as they can, and finally coming, and she, he recognizes her right away, right? There she is, Gehazi. What is going on? Verse 20. 26, run now, I pray thee, meet her and say unto her, is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, it is well. Is it? No. And by the way, I thought he was a man of God. I thought he was supposed to know this. Well, he's going to explain that God had not given this information to Elisha. You get the idea that if Elisha had been told this child was now dead, he would already been on his way. <laughs> But God did make her go all the way to him, right? That he may bring and come and do something about it. Verse 27. And when she came to the man of God to the hill and caught him by the feet, but Akazi came near to thrust her away. And the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her, and the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. He saw her heartbreak, knew something was wrong. While she told Gehazi all is well, it's clear it is not. She doesn't want to deal with Gehazi. She wants to deal with who? Elisha, and come directly to him and bring this request. Verse 28. Then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? So what's in her heart? Again, it's like the world. This isn't fair. I didn't ask for this, and then to give it to me, and then take it away from me. This is hard. This is terrible. This is a tragedy. Why did you do this to me? And when she says you, who is she really talking about? Why has God done this to me? Does that thought ever cross our mind? Yes. And again, what's the next thought? After I did this for you, after I did that for you, after I've done this for you, and I've been so faithful in things, why would you let this happen to me? But what kind of faith should we put in God? Does God know what we're going through? Does God know what was going to, did he know this was going to happen even before Elisha asked him to give her a child? Yes. Can you trust God that he is in control? Can you trust God that everything you do for him is worth it? Is a blessing in and of itself. And that God gives good things. Can we trust him in that? Her faith is shaken. She still knows God can do something, but she is questioning. <laughs> Why did this happen to me? Verse 29. Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins, and take my staff in thine hand, and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not. If any salute thee, answer him not again, and lay my staff upon the face of the child. He's got a plan. Take my staff, go run as fast as you can. Get down there. As fast. Don't even say hi to anybody. Don't salute him. Don't talk. Don't stop for something to drink. Anything. Just go. And as soon as you get there, just take my staff and put it on him. Does he have a plan? He has a prayer, doesn't he? His prayer is that, Lord, when you put this staff on him, he will rise again, right? And what happened? This is exciting, isn't it? Verse 30. And the mother child said, As the Lord lives and as thy soul live, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. And Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff upon the face of the child. So the, the woman and Elisha, they start heading out, but Gehazi's faster. He's kind of on his own. And he zips down there and he goes and puts the uh, staff on the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet Elisha and told him, saying, The child is not awake. In other words, what? It didn't work. And sometimes that's the way it is, isn't it? Sometimes we pray to God and say, Lord, can you please fix this problem? Can you please resolve this? And we pray, and what happens? Nothing. It didn't work. What do you do then? Then you say what? Well, God, you know, God's plan. 
<laughs> I guess that's it. I guess there's no question about it. I guess I just give up. That's not Elisha. Elisha says, okay, that didn't work. I'm going to pray some more. Is that okay, by the way? If God says no, can we ask again? What if he says no again? Can we ask again? You have to remember, Paul, how many times did he pray? And I'm not talking like, Lord, just remove this thorn in the flesh from me, like we pray sometimes. <laughs> but what? He prayed deeply and long and hard for that thorn in the flesh to be taken from him. And God said what? Nope. Nope. And then the third time, what? Nope. <laughs> We need to have enough faith that it's not us. See, if he's just sitting there saying, well, my staff trick didn't work, <laughs> who's he putting his faith in then? Him and the staff, <laughs> right? He's saying, okay, I'm going to have to go to God directly. I'm going to have to really put my time in here. I'm going to have to plead for this child. And are we willing to do that? Do we have enough faith in God that if we come to him and we pour our heart out to him, he will listen. Elisha does not give up. Verse 32. And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. And he went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain, between the two of them, and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay on the child and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes. So clearly COVID-19 was not a problem back then. Doesn't say they were wearing a mask or anything. And his hands upon his hands. So you get this picture of this dead child and this man laying face to face, hand to hand, mouth to mouth, right on, on top of him. Weird. <laughs> he stretched himself upon the child, and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro, and went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. <laughs> so it started to get warm. Then he went out and he walked around a little bit, praying, 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 and then went back down and did it again. And the guy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes, because that's how science works. No. <laughs> By the way, where was Elisha's face when he sneezed? <laughs> but his eyes opened, and he was alive. This is the blessing of God. Verse 36. And he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite woman. So he called her, and when he was come in unto him, he said, Take up thy son. Then she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out. It's a good story, isn't it? Did that really happen? Yes, it did. But what can we learn from this? See, we've got to get it out of our head that somehow we deserve anything. Right? That somehow we've earned it. And that somehow if we do the right thing, then God owes us anything. What does God owe us? Any? Nothing. Nothing. All we have is his promises. Does he promise to watch out for us? Does he promise to meet our needs? Does he promise to give us eternal life? Yes, he does. But let's not get confused. And this world tries to get us confused. That somehow, if we do this, like it's some kind of puzzle, right? If I just do it in the right order, if I just do these things, then I'll get this thing that I want. I somehow have to earn it. I've got to work my way up to it. I've got to get it. And then when we don't get it, or then it's not what we expected, what then we in, then start questioning. Should I have even done that? Should I have even been a child of God? Should I, and don't say this is crazy, because isn't that what the children of Israel did when they came out of Egypt? God, by his mighty hand, got them out of Egypt, and what was their first response when they ran into a problem? Oh, we shouldn't have left to begin with. There's no blessing in following God. There's no hope in following God. Why did I even do that? And that's what the world does. The world does that. They have an expectation, and when they don't get it, then they question everything that they've done, right? Who shouldn't do that? Us. We should be different. We should be a light out there. A light of faith that doesn't put our trace, faith in some process, does not put our faith in our abilities or our works in any way, but instead trusts who? Trust God. Trust God. And when something bad happens, don't panic. Don't worry. Don't fear. Don't try to fix it yourself. Simply turn to God and say, Lord, can you reverse this? <laughs> Can you fix this, please? And what if he doesn't right away? What should you keep doing? Keep praying. Lord, 
please. In fact, let's go to Matthew chapter 17. See an example from the life of Jesus. Matthew chapter 17. Starting in verse 14. Matthew 17, 14. And when they were come to the multitude, there came him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. So he has a demon-possessed son. And he's coming to the right place, isn't he? And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. See, I took him to the disciples, and they they said some things. They they said in the name of Jesus, and nothing happened. There's something wrong, right? Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil and departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. So (laughs) Jesus said it, and it happened, right? What does that leave you questioning if you're the disciples? We said those words. How come they didn't work? Well, here's the question. Are you putting your faith in the words? Are you putting your faith in you to say those words? Or are you putting the faith in the name of Jesus Christ? Guess which one they were putting their faith in. <laughs> Don't treat all of this like if I just say the right words, if I say the right prayer, if I do the right thing, if I have a problem, I should go to church for a few weeks so it gets it resolved. You know, don't, don't treat God that way. He's not a vending machine. I've got to put another quarter in and then I'll get what I want. All those things we do for God are the blessing, aren't they? And if he chooses by his grace to grant us more, fantastic. But what if he doesn't? Is it still okay? In fact, look what he says, verse 19. Then came the disciples of Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast them out? And Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief. You say, well, didn't they believe in Jesus Christ? Yes. But to solve the problem, who were they putting their faith in? If you put your faith in anything else, anyone else, even yourself, or the words, or this or that and the other thing, you're going to run into problems. He said, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall be removed, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. The faith isn't the problem, it's what you're putting your faith, what? In. You put your faith in yourself, you're putting your faith in something very small. But if you put a small amount of faith into the great God, what can you do? Anything. I find this interesting because there's a lot of people out there saying oh, right, right now, just in pulpits, saying right now, well, if you just have enough faith, if you have enough faith, you can tell God what to do. If you have faith, you can just tell God you've got to do this, right? By faith, I say it, I'm going to claim it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to say it right now, that's garbage. It's absolutely utter garbage get it out of your life that's a trick of the devil because then when it doesn't happen who do you start questioning when who should you be questioning all the time yourself (laughs) don't put your faith in yourself put your faith in god lord i put this in your hands lord you take it you do what is right you do what is good and trust god to do what is good verse 21 how be it this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting and sometimes we're going to put some effort into it aren't we It's not a magic staff. It's not a magic wand. It's not magic words. It's not abracadabra. It is faith in God and us humbly coming before him and praying, Lord, please help. And in this case, what was the reward? What did God decide to do? To bring that child back to life. But what if the answer is still no? What if he would have laid on that child 10 times, 15 times, 20 times, praying to God, and God still said, no, this child has died? Where's your faith then? Isn't that what happened to Paul? I mentioned it earlier. How many times did he pray to have that thorn in the flesh taken from him? Three times. Earnestly. From his heart. And how many would agree that Paul did enough to deserve it? 
From a human standpoint, I've got to say yes. <laughs> He was faithful, wasn't he? Went out. He'd been stoned to death. He'd been shipwrecked. I mean, so many things had happened in his life. Certainly, if anybody deserved God to do it, it would have been him, right? What did God say? No, it's better for you not to happen. And therefore, we have Paul saying what? Your grace is sufficient for me. In other words, what? I have faith in you. I have faith in your decision. Do we have that kind of faith? If we have that kind of faith in God, and it doesn't matter what happens out there, does it? Should we panic? (laughs) No matter what happens out there, no matter what's happening in our life, if we have faith in God, we have faith in God to take it to him, pray for him to resolve it, and trust his answer, right? And then do what? Move forward. Can we do that? Well, it's hard. (laughs) That is really hard. But can we do it? Because if we do anything else, then we start questioning, why am I doing this anyways? Why am I even trusting God at all? Why do I have faith in God at all? Why am I even his child? Why do I even go to church? Why do I even read his Bible? Why do I do? That is where our mind goes because we have a fallen mind. And who's going to push every one of those buttons? Satan's going to be just up there pushing every single one of them. Don't trust this. Don't trust this. Don't trust this. When we have to trust God in everything going on in our life, don't we? Can we still take it to him? Can we still ask? Absolutely. Sometimes we don't have because we don't ask. So ask. Ask earnestly. Ask in faith. But trust God's answer. And amazing what God can do. And will the world notice if you have that kind of faith? Yeah. Absolutely. Did they notice that Elisha had that kind of faith? Absolutely. In fact, somebody's going to notice, and it's going to lead us to next week's story. What happens when good things happen to bad people? <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to the story of Naaman <laughs> next week, and we'll see what happens there. So, because uh, sometimes our faith can be shaken then too, can it? It's like why is why are good things happening to bad people? Well, do we have enough faith to trust God there too? That's the question. So, put your trust in God, not in things, not in yourself, not in the words or anything else like that. Just put your trust in Him, right? One hundred percent, and know that the things you do for God do have a benefit, don't they? The things you do for God are a tremendous benefit, no matter if you get what you want or not out of it. <laughs> Hopefully you understand that what you get in that relationship with God and that growth in Him is tremendous. Something of great value, isn't it? Trust Him in that. 